Well, we've hit, we've hit the dead point of the offseason, that point in between free agency and the NFL draft. The, the big waves of free agency are over. Their roster acquisitions aren't done yet. So we got to bring in a guy who's covered the 49ers in multiple eras, who's done such a good job during this particular free agency period. I think he essentially predicted everything that would happen when we go back and look at his track record. But Mike Silver's in here from the San Francisco Chronicle. Mike, how you doing? Good, Dave. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. I, I'm hoping they're not done. And you know, I personally like the entertainment value of nothing else. But um, you know, I, I do think that the safety market has cratered to the point that they may be able to get a really good player uh, at great value. And so, even if they were done now, I think we'd look at their free agency period on the defensive side and say, wow, they've been really active, some really intriguing moves here, but that could kind of add some sizzle uh, later uh, in the game. This is exactly what you're talking about. We can bust this out very soon into this conversation. This is the depth chart. The teal represents players they've signed from the outside this season. And you could see this is defense down here, which I'm highlighting. I know it might be small, on some people's screens, but there's a whole heck of a lot of teal on the bottom half. And there's not a lot of teal, only Josh Dobbs really that I project to make the 53 man roster on the top half in the offense. And you mentioned safety. I think it's very clearly a thin position right now. I only project three to make the 53 man. And one of them, Tano Ufanga is coming off of a torn ACL. So, you know, we just look at this logically and we see they could use more depth, but they could probably also use somebody that could push the starters because Ufanga's coming off of that ACL and, and Jair Brown is going to be a second-year player. And that matches up, I think, well with the fact that you just mentioned it. The safety market is not doing well. So who's still out there? Justin Simmons is obviously the big name. They brought in Julian Blackman for a visit. They brought in Rayshon Jenkins for a visit, but he signed with Seattle. Uh, I think everybody constantly asks me about Simmons, Mike. And I think that's somebody that you've written a little bit about, right? Yeah. And he has some history with Brandon Staley, who they've now brought in as mm -hmm. assistant head coach and kind of tinkerer on the back end of the defense, if nothing else, um, with his roots in that Fangio system that Kyle Shanahan has long revered. Uh, and so you think about defensive backs and Justin Simmons was with Staley in Denver uh, while Staley was there as an assistant to Fangio after coming yeah. over from Chicago with him. Um, you know, four-time, I think, second-team All-Pro, if I'm uh, if I'm remembering right, but certainly a very decorated player, a little bit older, but not as old as uh, what the 49ers trotted out in uh, the postseason, at least uh, earlier in the postseason pre-Super Bowl when they had Tayshaun Gibson yep. and Logan Ryan uh, as their starters. But, um, you know, Julian Blackman's younger and has not been as decorated, but is, is someone that they really believe is an impact player. And so I know they had him in for a visit, as you said. If, if they could get a guy like that or Simmons, uh, you know, I, I think probably that person would be a heavy favorite to be a starter. And then I think a lot of outsiders would say, okay, well, Jair Brown, he was kind of in and out in the postseason. He came in as a rookie, uh, had some good moments like that interception of the Super Bowl, but it's still maybe a little raw, whereas Hufanga was a first team all pro in 2022. But I don't know that Hufanga uh, might not be the third guy. You mentioned the ACL. Uh, he's not a guy who had a ton of speed in the first place, which kind of explains why he went so low in the draft uh, going to the fifth round, you know, in 21. And, um, you know, he had all those splash plays at the start of 22, which is how he earned those all pro honors. And he had some of them in 23. But really, if you look at the second half of 22, uh, he had tailed off considerably, had his moments in 23 before the injury. But I think if you put all that together, including the, the relative lack of speed, you could see a situation where he's the third guy. I think you could also see a situation where they have Brandon Staley on staff now, where they get a little bit more creative, potentially with some three safety sets. They did that actually to break Hufanga into the lineup in 2021. 
He was the third safety. That was back when D'Amico Ryans was the defensive coordinator. But what's really interesting to me, I know you've covered the whole league, and I talked about this on the radio with, with, with Greg Papa last week. Staley with the Rams and with the Chargers got really creative with star defensive backs. He created yeah. literally a star position called the star. Yeah, Jalen Ramsey played it kind of a rover with the Rams, and, and then Derwin James played it for the Chargers. If they do get somebody like Simmons, who's a top end player, I could really see them getting creative on the back end, right? Because he's going to yeah, be that, up in that whiteboard with a man like a mad scientist. That is absolutely true. And uh, Ramsey, particularly, that was such a wise move because defenses tended to just throw away from him, as would often happen with an elite mm -hmm. cover corner. And by making him the star and making him so much. Uh, less predictable in his alignment and and so much more varied in his type of coverages and so much more in the middle where he was in the heart of the action. It just allowed Ramsey to make more plays and be a bigger part of it. Derwin James had injury issues, you know, throughout his career, but Staley certainly saw him as that. This is a little unconventional, but Diamador Lenore has some components of that that depending on how things fall. And, and we still have the draft coming up, which is obviously key. Uh, moving him inside, he may not just be a nickelback or a slot corner. He may have some star components, depending on how much yeah. of Bailey's uh, scheme they run. And so that signing of Isaac, and I'm going to butcher his name, is it? Yedem. Yedem. Yedem, so, yeah. Yedem, yeah. Isaac Yedem. Um, really intriguing signing at corner because if you look at his pedigree, he's kind of the opposite of what people think of Hufanga now. They see Hufanga now and they go, all pro, where it, it maybe hasn't been at that level lately. This guy was a journeyman and really had done much in the NFL. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden last year, quietly had this monster year in coverage. And, and some of the analytics sites I know really had him rated very high in terms of just locking it down and with if that year wasn't a fluke and he could replicate that now in this 49er system he could be the answer on the outside opposite Charvarius Ward and Charvarius Ward would still be that marquee cover corner but by moving Diamador Lenar inside it also creates possibilities for him as a playmaker you know we saw him force that fumble in the Super Bowl uh, he, he obviously fights for the ball. He's little, but it, it's an intriguing uh, concept. Yeah, and I mean, this guy, Yidham, had 14 pass breakups last year, despite the fact he only started for half the season. Wow. So, I mean, he at that pace, he would have led the NFL by a mile. I think Charvarius Ward had 16 or 17, and he started the whole year. Paulson Adebo went down in New Orleans. That's when Yidham took over. He's one of those 6-1 corners. I think, you know, you look at Ambry Thomas and you say, okay, he moves great, but he seems to always lose or very frequently lose at the catch point. Strength has been an issue. When you put on the tape of Isaac Yidham from last year, it was the total opposite. He would always win at the catch point. Just a really strong corner that I think the 49ers would, like you said, they would really like him on the outside. They've overtly spoken of Diamondo Lenore as a guy that I think they want to be their slot corner. John Lynch was asked about it at the owners' meetings. Are you going to bring in a slot corner? Is that a position you're going to look to draft? And he said, well, I think we have one on the roster in Diamondo Lenore. But the only way that you breathe easy about doing that is if somebody locks down the outside well, right? And like you said, Yidam, if he plays that way that he did with New Orleans, he could be that answer. I also think, Mike, that if we spin this forward to the draft, they haven't drafted a corner in the first or second rounds since 2014 when they picked uh, Jimmy Ward, but he might've been considered a, I don't know if he was considered a safety or corner. He played every position for the 49ers, but there, it's been a long time since the 49ers have used valuable draft capital, a cornerback. But I look at the depth chart. Now their top three corners. If you consider their top three to be Ward, Lenore and Yidam, all of them are only under contract for this season. So they've got a lot of expiring contracts. I think you're going to have to choose between, Lenore and Ward as far as who you pay. I'm not sure you pay both of those guys. To me, it logically adds up to the 49ers using one of their draft picks on, on a cornerback this year. Yeah, and I think you always draft corners when you, you know, it's such an important position. You're always drafting them, period. There were guys they drafted a little later that 
we've heard rumblings about, right? Sammy Womack had that big preseason as a rookie, and everyone said, hmm, and then the, the lights came on, and it, it hasn't been there. Uh, Daryl Luter, uh, we heard good things about, and then he just got hurt, and when they finally unveiled him, unfortunately for him, uh, he is now best known for the ball hitting his leg uh, on a punt that turned around Super Bowl 58 doesn't mean he can't end up being a good corner. But, you know, right now, 49er fans see that name and they go, ah, um, I'm thinking of corners they've drafted in the first round. I think it was Mike Rumpf back in the day from That's Miami. a long time ago, yep. <laughs> it was a- af- after my time. But, uh, yeah, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I look at this draft and they do have the 10 picks still, but – you know, they're at 31, which is practically the end of the first round. They're at the end of the second round. Um, they do have ammo to move up because, honestly, I think if you look at who they could draft in the first round, I think we could make a strong case for three positions if you're just drafted for need. You just stated a great one for corner. Great idea. They Especially, you know, to get a really good impact corner, a lot of times you got to – be up and high, wow. yeah. You know, maybe even trade up. Yeah. What wide receiver to me is very similar in that even if you are kicking the can for another year and retaining Brandon Ayuk, which we'll get into because I think that's a big if because we don't know how dug in he's going to be about not wanting to play and how that might play out uh, under the fifth year option. But if you solve that and either pay him or get him to play under the fifth year option and you have him and Debo and Kittle for another year, and you're, you're like, we'll worry about all that when we have to pay Purdy in another year, but right now we're running it back. I still think it's a, it's such a receiver-rich draft on paper that if you can get a guy at 31 or maybe even a little higher that helps you now and facilitates that future uh, because – a year from now, I don't think you're paying Ayuk, Debo, and Kittle all at that high level, let alone McCaffrey and Yushik um, and when you're paying Purdy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they don't really have a true one. You know, Ayuk, I think it plays like one, and you could make a case that he's your one and you pay him like a one and he's ascending and productivity, but he's not that big, strong beast who goes and gets the ball on the outside, you know, there there are very few of them who are true ones. Uh, and Debo is not really even a true two. He's a novelty piece, but he's so important to that attack, the positionless part of it, the attitude, the yeah. playmaking. And, and so you kind of got to do all that calculus. But to me, if you could go get a guy who, uh, you know, looks like a real one and l- helps your future – that's a consideration. And then the third case is certainly for offensive tackle. You know, in a perfect world, you get a guy who could play right tackle now and then get over to left tackle when Trent Williams uh, walks away. Um, and and I don't know that you could go much past 31 for any of those guys. So I, I, I wonder if you're trying to get two of them in the top 31 by trading up. Well, it's really interesting. The the receiver thought from you, I think that that's one of the more groundbreaking thoughts. I think everybody's focused on offensive line. And then you'll hear a few people say, oh, well, maybe some kind of defensive tackle or defensive end since they have a track record of doing that. But the last time that they owned the number 31 pick, they did pick a receiver. They 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 traded up in, in 2020. That was the, the year they traded to Forrest Buckner. They got Kinlaw with with the higher pick, but they also had 31 because they lost to the Chiefs in the Super Bowl, and they traded 31, and they traded a fourth rounder, and they traded a fifth rounder to move up to 25. I can see and, a similar type of marginal move up. I'm not saying it's going to be for a receiver, but for any position, because if you t- talk to people who know offensive line play or tackles, and there's a lot of good interior linemen in this draft, they're skeptical of a ready-made lineman being they're at 31. They think you might have to go a little bit higher. Now, we don't know how this is going to play out until Thursday night of the draft, right? But the 49ers have shown us, Mike, in the past that that they have been willing to take a late first-round pick and take a couple mid-round picks and move up marginally. I don't think they're going to take some kind of massive swing where they trade next year's one to move up high into the first round. But I do think that 
a marginal move is is really possible and could theoretically be the difference between a player who's more of a project and somebody who can help them win now. And I think that anything this team does with Ayuk, with the linemen, with with getting a cornerback, I think they need to make sure that those moves are not only geared toward the long term, but they need to be geared toward 2024. So yeah. whatever you do with Ayuk, you can't. You have to make sure you don't get worse offensively because they, they are so close. And I think that priority number one for everybody in the organization is trying to kick the door down this next year. So they have to kind of thread that needle, right? Yeah, and I think, you know, you saw the cap go up so much this year. I think it's very fair to go, we'll worry about next year, next year. They're yeah. not that irresponsible, but they can, you know, you can make, you can, as you said, you can choose between the corners next year. You can look at Kittle, Debo, and Ayuk and go, which one or two do we want? You know, you, you can make those decisions. Uh, but yeah, Trent Williams is still Trent Williams. Purdy's still on a rookie deal. It would be irresponsible not to try to win this year. Um, and I think, you know, your sensibilities are right. It's This is not a move you make before the draft. You're, you're watching the draft and seeing how it's playing out and who's yep. still around at, in the 20s. Um, and you're going up marginally. Uh, both of those things may be PTSD from a certain move made well before the draft that was not marginal that <laughs> didn't work out. And they've managed to win through the Trey Lance trade to their credit. And when you get a guy at 262 the next year who is uh, potentially transcendent. That, that helps make up for it. <laughs> yeah, very, very good. It, it, it kind of slack. comes out of the wash. But, um, you know, and then I think the other thing you add to that, Stu, and this is why I think you and I are going to have a very interesting uh, first couple of nights of the draft is um, if you hit a point with Ayuk where you don't think it's working, whether he's going to want too much or he's dug in on being so disruptive that there may be a trade, even though you technically have all this leverage, he's probably not going to sit out a season. And if you make him play on the fifth year option, he'll pr he probably will show up at the end and do that. But if you hit a point where it just doesn't feel like that's going well and you want Debo for the long haul, you know, maybe you are listening on draft night and trying to get in the first round if someone will trade you a one now for him. And that's the guy. And you, you do kind of the Buckner Kinlaw thing, but in real time. And again, PTSD, you get it right uh, and, and pick someone who. Uh, turns out to be uh, a really good player for you as opposed to a guy who never overcame those injuries at Kidlaw. Exactly. And that's the thing about the Buckner situation. I think people conflate the two. The They conflate the trade and the pick. The, the trade got amazing value for a defensive tackle for the 49ers to be able to get an upper half first round pick. I mean, you just saw what Legereus Sneed went for, right? That, that was peanuts compared to that in, in that trade. But the 49ers, what they didn't get right was the pick. I think if they pick Tristan Wirfs instead of Javon Kinlaw, everybody is lauding that DeForest Buckner trade to, to this day, but they didn't. Well, you know, well there's there. there's two parts of it, though. I think the other part is they chose Armstead over Buckner a little cheaper, but still, you know, close enough that you theoretically could have paid Buckner, traded Armstead, probably not gotten as much trade yeah, value. Yeah, you weren't going to get a one. That's the thing. Right. But yeah. but the problem, you know, the problem, the reason people like me are always going to hammer this, it's not just that you drafted a guy, Kinlaw, who had pre-existing knee problems. It was kind of a the rare Trent Balky style uh, pick. <laughs> oh, we got value. He's got a knee. And then he had knee problems. And it's not just that uh, you tr you picked Buckner over, or Armstead over Buckner and saved the money. It's that Buckner is the most durable premier interior yeah. lineman or one of them. Whereas Armstead now we saw uh, had, you know, durability issues toward the tail end of his time. Although I don't want to minimize how good Eric Armstead was for the 49ers. And oddly, I finally got around today to rewatching the Super Bowl. I'm only three quarters in, so no spoilers, please. Right now they're, Nobody they're very much happens. in the game. <laughs> uh, they're very much, but I, uh, uh, you know, Armstead had a really good game. Like, you know, I don't think I appreciated some of it with binoculars from up high in real time 
Uh, Bosa had a better game than I realized, too. I knew he had a good game, but Bosa was everywhere those first three quarters, at least. And Armstead, with the torn meniscus, having missed all that time, looked pretty good. He did. Uh, he actually graded out as having one of his best years as a pass rusher this past season. I don't think he was quite a, as good against the run, and I think some of that might have had to do with the, with the injuries, first the plantar fasciitis, then the meniscus. He might have had a tougher time taking on some of those double teams because it had been a little bit of the opposite before, right? He 21, he was one of the best interior run defenders in football. They went from the number 20 run defense to the top run defense when they moved Armstead inside full time in 21. Yeah, that was that great move. Uh, those two midseason moves because I came down and covered that Cardinals game. Yeah, they dropped them to three and five, and I, I and they just looked lifeless. I just yep. remember, I just remember shaking my head and just going, I was so wrong. I picked picked the 21 team to win the Super Bowl. I think before the season, the way I saw it was it was all lined up and. That game, they just looked lifeless. They dropped to two and five, three and five. And I figure, okay, they're going to bench Jimmy and play Lance at this point. Why not? The season's over. And then Kyle, you know, turned Debo into a running back. And uh, he and Kasarik and, uh, and Sala, Sala still or Domenico? No, that was Domenico's first year. Yeah. I think Domenico grew yeah. on the job that year. That was another yeah, thing. He that and, yeah, he and Kasarik and Domenico kind of had the inspiration to put Armstead inside and those two things along with a bunch of other little things aligning, man, they, uh, you know, came, came theoretically within a, another infamous play in franchise history of, uh, getting back to the Super Bowl. Yeah. 21 was the ultimate white knuckle ride. I mean, they, they had to dig themselves out of the hole that you're talking about. And in doing so they had to win like four straight elimination games. There was the, Packers Jimmy game had, in the postseason. Yeah, J Jimmy, Jimmy had to drive him. At, <laughs> yeah, J Jimmy had to drive him down, uh, down a touchdown at the end of regulation against the Rams. LA. Yeah, yeah. After being down seventeen nothing, when McVay ran in the end zone, uh, and, you know, and was celebrating early. Uh, yeah, what a game that was! Wild. And I mean, and circling back to Armstead, he he was awesome all of that year. And then then the plantar fasciitis hit in twenty two. He missed those thirteen games o over the the past two years. So yeah, I, and I think going back to the original mistake in twenty twenty, I think they were so preoccupied with let's just run it back for our revenge tour. Even though we've decided to trade the Forrest Buckner, why don't we? Just, that they were. Just, dead set on picking somebody to just plug and play as a replacement right. for DeForest Buckner. And right. that's not going to happen. You know, Buckner was too good of a player at that point. If, if you're going to do my, my stance is if you're going to do the trade and, and you like the value, which they obviously did go and pick the best player that you can with that pick. Don't be, don't be tunnel vision on a defensive tackle in that scenario. And they were. And, and because of that, I think that obviously they didn't, didn't get the finish that they wanted with it. But now here they are a few years later. They ultimately signed Javon Hargrave to make up for some of that lost pass rushing prowess they had from DeForest Buckner. And I, Mike, I look at it as they rebuilt this defensive line. I'll put this up on the screen again. You see all of the turquoise on the defensive side, but the defensive yeah. line, that's over 2,000 snaps that they've replaced. And I see them as replace, uh, as building it around Bosa and Hargrave. They've Obviously, Bosa's a centerpiece, but Hargrave is a really good pass rusher, not not the best run defender, but what they've said is, okay, let's make sure that we surround both of those centerpieces with the appropriate talent that's going to be able to set that talent up to succeed. So when you look at Malik Collins and Jordan Elliott, these are two kind of bigger fire hydrant type defensive tackles. It, previously, they had the taller types in Kinlaw and in Eric Armstead. So they went different body type inside. And then you add Leonard Floyd to the outside. And, and Leonard Floyd is somebody who, you know, people say a lot of cleanup sacks, but theoretically, that's what you need is a guy who will clean up for Bosa and Hargrave who should win a whole heck of a lot. And then obviously you've got your tour gross Matos who fittingly, they might play a little bit like Eric Armstead at the earlier parts of his career outside and inside. Right. And on, the, on the Amena who Amena who at his best. Yeah. You Arden know, that's key. A, the Arden key. So yeah. he's, he's, I, I would say Leonard Floyd quietly He's really durable. And remember, he yes. came into the league as an undersized edge, and people thought 
Is he going to hold up back there? Is he really just a, you know, kind of a glorified outside linebacker at a three, four? He's that guy plays. He can play uh, the run too. He's not terrible yeah. against the run. Better, and, and I think. You, I, not as I think Chase Young at times was a liability against the run last sure. year. Sure, and, and 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 the edge setting we all you so, know it all glaringly cropped up and hit us in the face in the playoffs in the Packer game and and certainly that first half of the Lions game it was like you know what what is happening on? yeah it was bad and so you know you you get a pro like Floyd uh, who is much better at that and then Gross Matos who also has that. Uh, ability, I, I think it just helps you all the way around, especially while you are theoretically waiting for Greenlaw um, to A, get back on the field, and B, get back to being Dre Greenlaw, because that is a it's a nice luxury, even when the edge is set perfectly, to have two unbelievable playmaking linebackers back there to clean it up. Yeah, the, the, the two linebackers behind that defensive line, I think really make this defense sing because you're taking some risks with the, with the wide nine alignment. You're, you, you really are trusting the personnel department to bring four Ferraris to that front because there's going to be more space in between each of the linemen. So especially the tackles have to be able to command a lot of space, which is why moving Armstead inside full-time in 2021 and, and he stayed healthy, why that was so important, but you have to have very specific players to to fit the scheme, to work with with what Chris Kosarek is bringing out there, and then the linebackers have to be extremely athletic because you are taking that gamble by elongating the defensive line. So it'll be interesting early on to see what Devondre Campbell can bring to the table. We've essentially covered the whole defense. Got Isaac. Yeah, Eden. and and Devondre, Devondre Campbell is like the opposite of uh, you're gonna. I'm going to say the name wrong again. Uh, Yedum, Yedum, Isaac uh, Yedum, yeah, Yedum. Uh, he's the opposite. Uh, last year, he, the analytics people hated him, and I think a lot of Packer fans Did thought too. he didn't play very well <laughs> either. But man, uh, what he's done before that has been eye popping and striking. He's been a an all impact pro. player for some good teams. Yeah, in 21, he was an All Pro. Now, fun trivia. And this is not nothing against Devondre Campbell, but if you remember the snow game against Green Bay that we talked about in that 21 season, that was his all pro year. Uh, Garoppolo, I think it was a first or second down early in that drive. He hit George Kittle on a, a huge pickup in, in, in the blizzard. It was very necessary. And what happened is they, they split Kittle out into the slot and Campbell picked them up one-on-one. -on -one, so they, they identified that play at the line of scrimmage and Kittle's and, eyes were like wide. his biggest footballs, I'm sure. And that that's the cheat code that is George Kittle, especially when he's healthy, right? That even an all pro linebacker who was good in coverage can line up against them. And you say, okay, no, we're going there because yeah. Kittle, I mean, at, there were 18 and 19 his receiving efficiency was on par with the best whiteouts in the game but, you know so he he I, he he might not be that type of mover in the open field anymore but i think he's more than made up for it with he's gotten stronger over time and he's got a supporting cat but kittle is a cheat code and, well, and the the edge blocking numbers in 19 uh were weird too like what they averaged on outside runs with him in the game and on the edge and not, you know, yes. that whatever that it was yes. some crazy number. It was wild. And I think that if, if, and when they finally are able to upgrade the right side of the offensive line, it will help that line be so much more ambidextrous because it's just lethal whenever they're, they're running Kittle in motion on the combo block with Trent Williams, to the left side, they, they don't have nearly that strength on the right side. Right. I, Feliciano improved things for them this past year. He actually did a good job. Run yeah. Blocking. In 21, and, and, they had Tom Compton, who, who was a really good run blocker, but the pass protection was lacking. But they still, they've always dealt with this kind of troublesome hole on the right side, whether it be run or pass blocking. And the line has just been lopsided. And it's been and, this way ever since they, for years, even back to the Joe Staley days. Well, and here's the deal it's, you know, you can't pay everyone, right? And they mm -hmm. pay all their skill players top of market, among others that we've talked about. Um, and they pay Trent Williams deservedly. So you look for ways you can get by without big contracts. And I know 49er fans do not want to hear this because you you know and I know in our social media and 
interactions, people are like, they got to go get some linemen. You know, look what Spags did to them in the Super Bowl. Look what the Chris Jones. But they just have so much faith in, in Chris Furster and his ability to make it work with, you know, Joe Schmoes at times. And they just figure he's going to figure it out. We're going to figure it out. It might not be elite, but we'll get by. And so I, I don't see that changing. Now, Now maybe in the draft they will go up and get a guy because at some point you're not going to have Trent Williams and then you're in real trouble. I, I see it as a value play for them. And again, I could put this back up on the screen. To me, it's staggering. I, I get it. Your contracts are going to expire at different times, but you could tell they decided to spend in free agency on defense and they decided to essentially run it back or wait for the draft on offense. And Mike, you see how some of these contracts worked out. I thought that the guard market and the 49ers definitely would should be interested in a guard. I thought that market completely overheated. I mean, uh, Hunt got what twenty million from Carolina, but you you look at uh the two uh, guards that the Rams signed, Kevin Dotson and Jonah Jackson. Both of those guys are really good run blockers. Neither of those guys are, I think, world beating pass protectors, but they both commanded sixteen million a year. I and if you look at the cost structure here, that just didn't work for the, you know the the scale of deals that the 49ers were giving out they thought there was way more bang for the buck on the defensive side so i naturally think they're looking they're looking draft for 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 the offensive line you, you got to give mcveigh i mean mcveigh definitely plays to type when he decided we're running jet sweeps and we're going to run uh 11 all the time he was like let's go get brandon cooks we're making a trade we're going to have three guys there now he's into the inside power running and duo and all that. He's like, all right, I want road <laughs> graders a guard when he, you know, when he wanted a new quarterback who could move a little better and do things off schedule. He traded Jared Goff and a whole lot to get Matthew Stafford. Um, I, so, I mean, to me, I hear you like on paper, you go, they paid two guards like, whoa, but it's, it's very, it makes sense to me given that, Sean is now in love. Yeah, it, it, it's completely on brand for the way the Rams have built their team, and it yeah. completely makes sense that the 49ers are going in the, the opposite direction with this. And, you know, I think th I've talked about this a, a bit over the last month, just watching this free agency. I just think the league is in a super interesting place in that and you talk to off offensive line coaches, you talk to defensive line coaches, but over the past decade or two, the athleticism – on the defensive line has just outpaced what's happening on the O line. So you almost have a surplus of these ultra talented edge rushers, also defensive tackles because Aaron Donald showed us all that you could be light and super athletic and dominate on the interior. So these yeah. guys are just running circles around offensive linemen now, mainly with athleticism. You've seen guys who would have been receivers in some cases, 20 years ago. I had a friend in high school who definitely, you know, everybody was like, oh, this guy's going to be a receiver. He was 6'5". He was maybe 2'10", 220. But the coach in high school put him at edge rusher, and uh, he got a D1 scholarship because of it. That was before anybody was really doing that. But now I think you see it across the entire sport is that the best athletes are headed to that D line. And I'm not so sure that outside of Trent Williams, you know, he's the exception. I'm not so sure that the best athletes are playing along the offensive line. And I think well, and we'll probably see the pendulum swing back, but at this well, point, the, the D-line's ahead. And the other problem is because of the way the college game has evolved, these linemen come into the league having run one protection, right, two protections. Their, their quarterbacks are back there clapping yeah. and looking at wristbands. So <laughs> other than your alma mater, which David Shaw did an incredible job of actually running power and – uh, you know, running pro style components or traditional pro style components and and playing, you know, smash mouth football at times. Uh, there were very few other programs that were turning out linemen that that you could that you didn't have to try to reprogram that way. Well, I mean, and speaking of Stanford and Shaw, that obviously started with Jim Harbaugh. He's back in the league now. It's going to be fascinating to see. I'm so excited. Yeah, what they run. Because defenses, since the last time he's been in the league, which was a decade ago, defenses have gotten way smaller. I mean, you could illustrate that through the Navarro Bowman, Patrick Willis. Those are the right. linebackers for the 49ers. When Harbaugh was the coach, 
those guys, I mean, people would laugh if they saw a 240 plus 250 pound linebacker. Now these guys, there's linebackers as light as 210 pounds in the league now. So the, the league has just gotten quicker and smaller defensively. And I think Harbaugh was running a ton of power at Michigan because obviously college football got smaller too. Yeah. I, I think he might try to continue to make his, his hay by zagging while everybody's zigging and and just pounding the rock in in an old school fashion i i hope so man i i i remember uh talking to john harbaugh after jim took the michigan job and i covered jim as a player and go way back with him we so there, we've had great moments and then we we've had moments where i looked at him going is this the guy that I, like i used to have drinks with because we have no connection right now uh he, we have no human connection in this moment and you know he he's a little out there, but by and large, uh, you know I've known him for a long time. I have a lot of faith in his conviction and and how he builds it. And I remember with John, I was standing with John Harbaugh, maybe at an owner meeting, and we were talking about Jim going to Michigan. And I said, I read somewhere that someone said I don't know how this is going to go. And I said I know how it's going to go. He's going to have big farm guys blocking people off the screen and, you know, and big running backs. And it took, it took a little longer than, you know, I thought it would. I thought that would happen in a year or two and he would just be winning national championships. And it, it took a while. Uh, but yeah, I, I hope he, cause I want to see what it looks like with Justin Herbert running play action, uh, you know, with a massive offensive line yeah. and a, and a power back who, is putting the fear in defenses and then, oh, I, I'm keeping it and drop it back. Uh, yeah, I think I'll probably complete this pass. Well, just given how quickly he turned the 49ers around in 2011 and that he inherited a roster with a lot of talent, especially on that defensive side, there was a lot of talent. I always thought it was, you know, we, we talked about this. We were texting about it. It's like, are they really going to release Joey Bosa? Like, that, to, to me, I just didn't. You know, I was ready for the the moment in case it happened because everybody seemed to be talking about it. But I kept on remembering Jim Harbaugh over 10 years ago when he inherited the 49ers. Why would he want to step into the league and start letting go of good players? Like, I kind of figured he would. Obviously, they they let go of Williams and, and they yeah, found a way to keep, get under I thought the top, he'd keep. But. I thought he'd keep one of the receivers. But yeah, uh, yeah, I you know, um those teams, the talent, it was so it was so cool how the talent on that team that Scott McLuhan had brought in so many talented people and it coalesced in that year. But I think people are under, you know, their memories are are not even doing Harbaugh justice. He did that in a lockout year. So yeah. imagine a new coach coming in and turning a team that hadn't been winning for years and taking them to an overtime in the NFC championship game and then staying at that level or better for two more years, but doing it when you didn't have any of your players around till August uh, and a quarterback who you were inheriting, who had been through a lot and wasn't, you know, necessarily someone you, you run in. Oh, Alex Smith, he's going to take it to another level. Um, and remember they had, uh, my memory of it is that early on there were some weird hiccups. Like people thought, I, I think Alex Smith had such a bad preseason game or practice at one point that people were talking about Kaepernick starting that year as a rookie. Um, and that it didn't actually happen. I think that was also the preseason where Sean Payton did a welcome, yeah, yeah. welcome to the league and blitzed the heck out of him. And Harbaugh was like, oh, my, what do you mean? Like I – is it an unwritten rule that you don't know, blitz in the preseason? And Sean Payton was like, yeah, actually, we're doing it every day. Anyway, play, especially in a lockout year. I think that yeah. game, I was about to mention it, I think that game illustrated how how much of an uphill climb that year was because you had to get all your protections and all that set without really an offseason, right? And and you're putting in a new offense, and they eventually figured out it wasn't a good offense that year. They ended up middling as far as rankings went, but it was just a monstrous defense. And the, I think the tragic irony of the 2011 49ers is they lost because of special teams. Right. And they had an amazing special teams unit over the course of the year. If they yeah. would have won that Super Bowl or just that NFC championship, it would have been on the fuel of defense and special teams. 
carrying a mediocre offense, but obviously Kyle Williams happened in, in that NFC title game. And then the next well, year, they were supercharged on both sides of the ball, but the defense dropped a little bit, some injuries, and, and obviously they, they blew it against the Ravens. If they could have got that playoff, I, I think Frank Gore walks into the end zone. I think it was the second down play where yep, they, yep, they called yep. the timeout. But they had that weird system where nine coaches had to talk before they got a play in and they had a first-year quarterback. I, I I am so old that I – so I started covering the 49ers in 1989, which was uh, – they were about to win their fourth Super Bowl. Uh, yeah, there's a couple <laughs> of guys I covered uh, all the time. It was it was a wild time, but it's funny because um, their attitude on special teams, and that was George Seifert's first year, uh, as I understood it as a young beat writer, was – uh, you know, people say it's a third of the game. It's really not. It's probably like a 12th of the game. And our offense and defense are so good that we just don't really care. And, uh, you know, George Seifert's college roommate, Lynn Stiles, was their special teams coach. And so when we would ask questions about the underperforming special teams, uh, which in included kicker and punter at times, uh, George would kind of shrug it off. And we'd be like, well... He's not going to fire his boy. That's like his college roommate. Uh, and uh, that was a wild time pre-salary cap, too. They just thought, we'll, we'll be so good on offense and defense, whatever. Uh, and now, of course, I just saw a Super Bowl where uh, special teams may have tipped the balance. And uh, crazy. Well, and the 21 season, the uh, Richard Hightower was Kyle Shanahan's college teammate at Texas. So I'm getting go. some echoes from the past. And they obviously didn't renew his contract after 2021. They brought in Brian Schneider. But 21, you can make the argument that that special teams cost the 49ers a championship because it cost them at least two games in the regular season against Seattle, right, where yeah. they were giving up the, yeah. the, the fumble returns and the fake punt for a touchdown. It was atrocious, which is why they – probably made the change after that year if if they get another two wins in that regular season their path is a whole lot easier in the postseason and I, i'm still convinced that th that they just died of exhaustion against the rams in that game they were they were cruising along they're fighting but they just hit a wall in that fourth okay, quarter gotta, so gotta catch the meatball pick but yeah, uh and tart dropping that pick. Yeah. And, and, and by the way i've come a long way since 1989 in 1989 i was 24 and thinking George Seifert would never fire his college roommate. And since then, I've seen guys fire their brother. You know, <laughs> like I've seen a lot of stuff. Well, so, you know, I saw Kyle block Matt LaFleur from taking Mike LaFleur. <laughs> like I'm used to it now. I, every, you know, uh, Matt LaFleur just fired his friend Joe Barry. I, like it happens all the time. So, uh, I was I was a lot more naive then. Yeah, I mean, you've seen so much, including the unveiling of this the helmet unveiling. right here. The unveiling in 1981. Not a lot of people know. I think we brought awareness to this, and you actually have a T-shirt that you can tell I us about. I still have the shirt. Uh, well, I'll, I'll take you through. So uh, the 49ers won the Super Bowl both in 89, Walsh's last year, and in – or in, yeah, eight. 88, 88 season, 80 yeah, Super yeah. Bowl in 89. They won it in Walsh's last year. And then the next year, Seifert's first year, they won the Super Bowl by 45 points against the Broncos. And in 1990, they were going for uh, the three-peat. And they were matched up against the New York Giants in the NFC Championship game um, at home. Uh, they went up 13 to 9. or uh, And... Uh, the Giants were playing with a backup quarterback, Jeff Hostetler, because Phil Sims had suffered a season-ending injury. This is Bill Parcells, Lawrence Taylor, the heyday, Belichick as defensive coordinator. Uh, and the uh, infamous play where Joe Montana gets hit so hard by Leonard Marshall that he injures his spleen and breaks a rib. And as Joe told me, just to be safe, as Letter Marshall's falling on him as they're going to the ground, Letter Marshall takes Joe's throwing hand and cracks it and breaks it just in case. So in comes Steve Young. The Giants get another field goal. It's 13 12. They're trying to kill the clock late. He throws a pass over the middle to Brent Jones, uh, 20 something yard completion for a first down. 
near the middle of the field. And Brett Jones, who was not always so demonstrative, spikes the ball in Lawrence Taylor's face and yells, it's over, which, I mean, it was Lawrence Taylor. So uh, infamously, they're trying to run out the clock. They hand the ball to Roger Craig. Uh, Jesse Sapolo, the center, gets beat by nose tackle Eric Howard, whose helmet dislodges the ball. But Roger Craig turns, and the ball is here, and it's falling into his hands. And his hands are down to the ground, ready to recover the ball. LT, who had been cut blocked, rolls across and gets his hands above Roger Craig's and seizes the fumble. Haas Settler takes him down the field. They kick a field goal on the last play. They go to the Super Bowl and beat the Bills, and the 49ers do not get the three-peat. Well, that was four years into a Joe Montana, Steve Young period of quarterback craziness that we would need an entire episode to even begin to do justice to. Uh, But that was when the 49ers decided we're going to revamp. And uh, there was something called Plan B Free Agency that predated unrestricted free agency. They exposed Ronnie Lott, the greatest defensive player in franchise history and one of the greatest defensive players in the history of the game. Uh, and Roger Craig, their star running back and uh, three-time Super Bowl winner, they exposed them both to Plan B free agency. They ended up siding with the rival Raiders. Well, the whole thing did not make fans real happy. Uh, now they're getting rid of Ronnie Lott, Roger Craig. They lost that game. They also announced something very strange, was which was that Steve Young was going to get three designated starts the next season. Uh which, as Joe Montana later put it to me, yeah, great. They're going to give him the easy games, and I'm going to have to play the hard <laughs> ones. Uh, and, I didn't know about that. I didn't oh, hear about yeah. the designated starts. It, it ended up being a moot point, right? Because it Montana didn't moot play. Because Montana hurt the elbow and you know only played one one half of one game for them the next season in 92 after two years of elbow injuries before being traded. But there was so much pressure on the Montana Young situation at Seifert, and Carmen Policy, the team president at that point, were just committed to getting Steve Young somehow into the mix, and Montana wasn't taking any of that well. So amid all of this craziness, Lott and Craig exposed to Plan B free agency. Steve Young is going to get three designated starts over Joe Montana. The 49ers hold a surprise press conference and don't tell anyone what it's about. So we come down to Santa Clara. This is the room that is now uh, on the side where they have their uh, coaches' offices and all that, but on the first floor, uh, their their press conference room. Uh, And we all sit down in the room, and there are T-shirts sitting at our seats, and they are white T-shirts. I I wore one of these because I still have mine. I wore one of these, I think, in January to uh, Santa Clara, uh, this year for everyone's amusement. And for, uh, I think next time I wear it, I'm going to make sure I see Jed because Jed will get the most amusement out of this. But white T-shirts with that logo that that says 49ers with the weird, you know, print and, and all that. And it just said the unveiling and, it, and the date. And uh, those two men right there, this was driven by Carbon Policy, the team president. They we're sure that this was going to be a hit, that this was going to be a new era. And and it was, they were ahead of their time in that if you change the logo, you change the uniforms, uh, you know, it's a marketing bonanza and, and people didn't all show up at games and jerseys back then, but it, it was a cool idea. But A, it was a really bad logo and B, it just, fans were looking for a reason to rebel and, the rebellion began immediately, and I remember the moment because that press conference room opened into the locker room. We usually went into the locker room from the outside where the practice fields are and through those two doors. I think it's now the maybe the pool or the cafeteria. I don't know what they've exactly yeah. done with it. But it also, you could go in straight from the back of that press conference room, and as soon as the press conference ended, they opened that door and I think players were in for some reason. Back then, the offseason program was different, and they were in for they, – they'd had something. And immediately, there's about 
10 of us around Joe Montana. And he didn't know what was going on. And we said, Joe, check out our new shirt. And he he just looked at it and he said, it looks like the World League, which was one of the, <laughs> one of the minor NFL leagues. Europe world yeah, predecessor. Was, yeah, and, and, it might have, and, and a few other players similarly looked at it and they were like, uh, and fueled by that and other things, fans were just like, nah. And I can't remember when Coke tried to unveil new Coke. I think it was in the same era, maybe a little before that, uh, where people – People rebelled, and it lasted about two days. Same thing. I remember I had uh, friends visiting from out, out of state, and uh, my wife and I were showing them around San Francisco, and I got a call. Hey, you got to go. <laughs> you got to go and write. And I had to leave this day of sightseeing that I was so excited about. You know, the season was over. We're like checking out the Golden Gate Bridge, whatever. And I had to go back and write because they had rescinded the logo and put back, thankfully, put back the uh, the beautiful logo that today remains the 49er logo. I'm looking up the Coca-Cola logo. I want to see. If just get Google new Coke and uh, it'll be. Here, I'll do it while we're on, too. New Coke happened in, and I think they even, yeah, that was in 85. Um, but in 85, they tried to rebrand it. They, they, well, what they, they just didn't, it wasn't a rebrand. They changed the taste. What happened was they said, Oh, you guys like Coke. It's the biggest selling soft drink in the world. Cool. Now we have a new Coke. So when you order Coke, it's going to, be our new formula and wow. people didn't like the taste. And so what they did was after not very long, a couple of days, they said, fine, we're going to have regular Coke and call it Coca-Cola classic is going to still exist. And then, but we're still going to market new Coke. Cause we know over time you're going to love new Coke better. And there was a lot of time, but nobody ever liked new Coke better. A few people did, but it was Coca-Cola classic for all those years. And so it wasn't a rebrand. It was a reformula and the new formula never caught on and people wanted their old sugary formula. I think new Coke might've been sweeter or well, maybe less, less sweet. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, well, it's funny that they've decided that the best path forward is just totally own it. This is their website. Coca-Cola ah! company. <laughs> Look, new Coke, the most memorable marketing blunder ever. <laughs> Good for them. And by the way, number two is the unveiling. I think it's like right there under underneath. Oh, on on their page right here. No, I'm kidding. Oh, I, yeah. I think number, number <laughs> oh, one I is you the Coke. unveiling of the new Coke. Yeah, number, number two, two is will be the unveiling. The unveiling. Of the yeah, the, I got it. In I was fact, I might. I I might wear the unveiling for for one of the draft nights. the The next time I know that we're going to see Jed for some reason, maybe a game, I'm going to rock the unveiling t shirt in all its splendor. It's still, you know, I don't have very many t shirts from, you know, thirty three years ago, but uh, I somehow still have that one. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. I, I can't, I hope I'm there that day. I'm there every day. So hopefully I, yeah, I'm sure, day. I'm sure you'll be there. The question. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and by the way, I, I'm in no hurry to be there. I, I think you and I would agree. We like, listen, I, I, I go there a lot, but what you have been through these last uh, few seasons as a beat writer, I mean, you mentioned 21, what a crazy year that was. 22 was, just about as crazy with the three quarterbacks and digging a hole and making the big turnaround and then, you know, getting all the way to the NFC championship game, the Trey Lance trade, uh, you know, you've covered a lot in these last few years. So uh, I'm happy if you and the, the people who are there every day get a little bit of a break. Well, and the problem is with a deep run, such as the Super Bowl, and plus week 18, you're now – covering a super bowl in mid-february the right. combine is in late february they, yeah they, there's your they have, season, right my former employer the nfl network has helped the league th this master plan to suck up as much of the offseason as possible and and listen i i caveat i i am glad that people are interested year-round 
I am happy to help report and opine during all that time. Uh, I'm not trying to whine. Like we have really good jobs, obviously, and we want consumers to be really into the product. I'm just saying like, it's possible that on June 28th that a lot of people could go without worrying about who the swing lineman is going to be yeah. coming out of trading cap. That's, that's all I'm saying. That's such a 1985 luxury, Mike. That's, that's not right. a luxury anymore. <laughs> well, well, honestly, we used to laugh and be jealous of our baseball writing peers because baseball back then in the late, 80s and early 90s had this incredible ability to stay relevant in terms of copy and headlines there people were, were reporting about baseball offseason like it was a big deal and football offseason kind of didn't exist wow. back then the tables we used, turned huh That's, yeah we used yeah. to be really jealous like man i wish we could get some run in the offseason our editors won't even call us back but uh, yeah, be careful what you wish for. Well, now you essentially have that late June, early July period. But then by 4th of July, people are already starting to talk about training camp. I, and- I know th- I know the day it all ended, and I have to Google what day it was. But And, and, and Andy Reid knows I have a bone to pick with him on this. But uh, Donovan, McNabb, Donovan McNabb was on the trading block, I think, heading into the 2010 season. Um, and everyone kind of knew it, and they were going to trade Donovan McNabb. But when? Was it going to be right at the start of the league year during the frenzy? Was it going to be on draft night? Was it going to be after the draft? Was it going to be somewhere in between? You know when Andy Reid decided to do it? Easter Sunday. And that's when that was the end. That's when all the, boundaries were crossed. Yep, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the floodgates could open at that like point. Like I, I get, I get it that Christmas is now ruined. I don't like it, but apparently Christmas is now ruined for NFL media people. I get it that Thanksgiving has long been a thing. I understand Easter. You think like you could escape Easter? It's way in the off season. The draft. It's before the draft. It's after, after the start of the league year. Yeah. Nope. Andy Reid, the Grinch that stole Easter. Wow. So I, um, it's funny you say that. I didn't even know that, but I kind of ceremoniously and thankfully it was possible. I did not post anything, no tweets, no videos yesterday. So it was good. I, I didn't, you know, there's part of me that doubted that this would be possible. I thought there'd be some kind of <laughs> crazy back of the, or Brock Purdy's bonus. He got a $740,000 bonus. I thought that might get announced or something yesterday. Thankfully didn't get announced until today. We were talking I, about Lenore. He got 790 K Purdy, 740. And none of that money earned. hits the salary cap. It's earned. it comes from the league. Yeah. That, I, like, I like that. Pool. <laughs> those guys earned it and and uh, you know another reason i like it is because i hate the rookie wage scale and how the then current players sold out their uh you know their successors on this and uh we now have a system that insulates teams from draft mistakes in a way that it didn't before because yeah in the old days you traded up to the third overall pick and took Trey Lance and it didn't work out and you had to dump him for a four. Yeah, that's painful. But part of the pain was you were paying them this slotted contract at third overall that more reflected the market value of the number three overall pick. Uh, And now you're getting an incredible deal. That's why to bring it back to Joey Bosa, I will never understand, you know, usually now, there are no draft holdouts because it's not only slotted, it's literally slotted because of the rookie wage scale. There's very little to argue about, but Joey Bosa uh, didn't show up until into the preseason of his rookie year. And what he and the chargers were fighting about was offset language. And I think I, I literally had this conversation with John Spanos who was, good natured about it. Who's the chargers owner and uh, president of football operations. But I said, or maybe this was with Tom Telesco who was then the general manager. He's now the Raiders general manager. But I was like, dude, of all the Hills you're going to die on. So what, what happened was teams were putting in offset language um, in these rookie contracts. In other words, 
if you pick Joey Bosa and you decide before the end of his rookie deal, which is artificially low and slotted, this guy's so bad that we don't even want him. We're cutting him. And someone else finds value in him and signs him and is willing to pay him something. You wanted that much money offset from what you still owed him as a team. And and Joey Bosa was like, I don't want offsets. If you cut me within those four years, I want the money that I get from another team. I want to be able to double dip. And the Chargers were like, absolutely not. (laughs) You're already ripping him off. He's not getting what the old picks used to get. And if you screwed up that pick, which would be hard to screw up by picking up Bosa that high. I mean, they were pretty slam dunk picks. But, like, if you screw up that pick so bad that he's so worthless that you don't even want him on your team and someone else finds value in him, go ahead and write the check. But I don't remember what how they finally solved that one. But, anyway, I love it when guys like Diablo or Lenore, who were low draft picks, or – Brock Purdy, who was the Even last one, <laughs> yeah. outperformed their measly little slot. Because remember, the, the rookie wage scale also prohibits Brock Purdy from being able to get an extension under the old system. He would have signed a, a lousy deal as the 262nd pick. And then after that first year, he would have been like, yo. Time to pay they, me, yeah. <laughs> he would have had a lot of leverage because he would have been under contract, but he would have been like, at least, like, you know, like, get me up to, you know, uh, low-level starter money, and they would have done it, and now you're not even allowed to reopen it until after year three, which is yeah. great for the 49ers' salary cap. But if I'm Brock Purdy, year three, I mean, I'm looking at all these contracts, and I'm like, oh, but, you know, it's painful. But Well, it's, it's insane. I mean, his, his cap number this year is literally 150th of the, the top quarterback contracts. So there's the moral, four guys yeah, the over moral, 50 million. Yeah, the moral of the story is with the 262nd pick, find an incredible quarterback. quarterback. And, and you'll and win you every time. Set, It'll be perfect. Yeah. Set as a franchise. <laughs> and again, that was what got the 49ers out of the, the Trey Lance situation. Not only the fact that Lance was slotted for number three money, which I remember when Sam Bradford signed his deals, the number one overall pick. I mean, it was such a massive contract and and then you had the whole Eli Manning situation right you because you you didn't know it, it gives it's essentially hand holding on the way to, to to ratifying the contract now as you mentioned there are small things like the offset language that could still come into dispute but it used to be the wild west you draft it the was, guy and they negotiate yeah. you know who and, knows well, where to end up and and the other thing is which is crazy is it wasn't just what Sam Bradford got on that first contract when people thought he was the number one guy. He's gonna once it was clear that he was injury prone and was good but not great, he was still negotiating new deals off those crazy. Deals, deals. Yeah, yeah. So they look at his, career, his career earnings are incredible. incredible. Yeah. Like, Sam Bradford now as the number one overall pick, his career earnings, you know, that first contract wouldn't have been great, and his second contract. Would have been okay, but it wouldn't have been, you know, massive. But it's it's crazy how much it impacted. I remember uh, 130 million, Mike. I remember being at a uh, Cal Stanford basketball game uh, courtside. I was sitting with Scott Fujita. It's back when we managed to get Mike Montgomery and uh, have an incredible coach, which I saw. I was on the other end of that equation for. A long, long time. As I said to Mike Montgomery the first time I saw him in the Cal Athletic offices, where are my seven foot twins? Like, I'll just take one <laughs> pair of them, you know, let alone two. But uh, he did an incredible job at Cal. And Scott Fujita and I were at this game just enjoying an incredibly well coached team and success. And uh, I remember at one point the Stanford cheerleaders were close by and I was striking up conversation. And I'm not, I'm not really, I'm not a a mean taunter, but sometimes I try to engage. And I think what I said was something along the lines of how is Andrew Luck staying in school another year? I thought he was smart. And what I meant was 
the the system's about to change on him. I think it ended up changing anyway. But in my mind, he can sneak in and get the, like Cam Newton. I think was the last one. So at the yeah. time, I'm thinking he could get that last Cam Newton deal, and instead he's going to get this because they were talking about doing the rookie wage scale. Uh, I think it would have happened anyway. But I just remember thinking like, no, no, go now. It's the last chance yeah, yeah. before the system is ruined. Plus, selfishly, I obviously was eager to. Uh, move on from that. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, didn't want to see Andrew Luck one more time in 2011. That his last big game was at home against Cal. That one was a bit closer. It was the 2010 one. You're probably oh. fresh off of the 2010 one at the time. That was the yeah. one where he ran over Sean Catus. Correct, correct. Yeah. And then and was so he not only ran over him on a kill shot, he literally <laughs> stopped to glare at him. Like you know, yeah. like Andrew doesn't really. Taunt, but he kind of curiously looked at him on the floor like did you just try to kill me and then continued on his merry way this is a true story i have a a close friend who went to cal um dr aj narula he's he's a very very high up guy in the pharmaceutical injury industry helped uh with some of the covid uh cures to, or uh you know the antibody stuff like but he cares a lot and he just looked at me and he said all things considered, that might be the worst play in Cal football history. And I, I didn't have a rebuttal. It was like, we're going to lose by a 1,000 points. Their marquee quarterback just ran over our safety on a kill shot, glanced at him, and continued on. And I don't see the future trending well. So it wasn't good. Might, might have been the last game at the old Memorial Stadium. Um, were, yeah, that's a great year, question. Uh, the next year yeah. they were at Pac Bell or whatever it was called, AT and T Park back then. I think you're right. 20, yeah, that was and, 2011. Then they moved back in in 2012. Uh, I liked the last game at the uh, old Stanford Stadium, I, which I believe was the uh, Steve Levy, our fullback, stepping in at quarterback, and uh, went up to. That was not a good year for Stanford. I just remember the entire Cal section was chanting UC Davis at the end of the yeah. game. Uh, because back then Stanford had lost to UC Davis. That so that that was yeah UC Davis beat him uh, to start the season. I think Cal got him. I do think that was the year when Stanford has Cal at home. They play Notre Dame. They also lost to Notre Dame right after they lost to Cal. I still remember watching on TV because they had the bulldozers ready to go. Right, it's like <laughs> as soon as yeah. yeah, we got to go. We got to tear this place down. We got to got to rebuild it. But it, it's incredible uh, that they finished so quickly. But. Uh, yeah, that was a big old stadium. And uh, back in the heyday, man, like I saw that stadium full. And and I just wish, like if, you know, the first big game I went to was as a high school senior was 1982 of all things. So I was hooked. Oh, but wow. I didn't know. Um, I was going to ask you what, what your years were there. So you saw that game in person. Uh, yeah, and I was across, you know, I mean, what a crazy thing. But um, two thirds blue and gold, one third Red and white um, sold out, and beautiful day, incredible Bay Area above it. And um, at one point, Cal fans did the wave, but Stanford fans kept it going. Like that was the vibe. Like the the entire stadium, two thirds blue and gold, one third red and white, did the wave together. So it, you know there was a fierce rivalry. But now, one crazy thing about the play to show you what a crazy time it was. In 1982, back then, games weren't really on TV that much. And uh, that game was only on the next day as a half-hour recap show on one of the local, it was either local ABC, local CBS, you know, KGO. One of the stations had a half-hour recap show. That was the only tele, uh, you know, televising of that game. And there was one shooter. One camera person, and I was on the same side as the cameras, and I can tell you, I didn't follow that pl the play. I didn't follow it clean. Once the band's on the field and, it, you know, your brain just doesn't really compute it. And I knew Cal was still running and eventually celebrating, but I couldn't have really told you what happened. That shooter, the one shooter, got it. If that shooter doesn't get it, I'm sitting here talking about it right now, not knowing what I'm saying, sounding like a fool, and nobody really knows because there are no cell phone videos. I mean, yeah. so 
that's almost as incredible as the event itself that that one person got it so clean. Yeah. I mean, it's it, iconic video. I would argue even as a Stanford alum that it, I think it's the most iconic moment in college football history. I think that because what led up to it too, John Elway led Stanford oh. down the field and had what was it like a fourth and 20 or fourth and, fourth and 17, fourth and fourth 17. And 17 at his own 13 and through a, one of those Elway lasers yep. that I, I would describe it as, I think it was Emil Harry who caught it. It assimilated into Emil Harry's chest like at the 40 something, I was like thrown so hard that he couldn't drop it because it got lodged inside of it. Yeah. It just went like this. And you know, (laughs) and then, you know, once that happened, it was like, ah, and it was an incredible game. There were two one handed touchdown catches by Cal Elway doing that stuff. Just, it was, it was an incredible game, but uh, you know, and I know Gary Terrell really, really well. The, the ill-fated trombonist who's, you know, good friend of mine, just a, a great dude. And, uh, you know, didn't really see it because his back was turned playing in the Stanford section and all of a sudden became part of history. But, you know, it, it did change football history. That hadn't been conjured that in desperation, why not just throw it backward and see what happens? And, it, you know, it, it has um, obviously, you know, changed the way people approach that scenario. Um, and, you know, there's this play at the end of the season in the 2000s, I think, where the Saints uh, were down seven on the la- last play, uh-huh. um, needed to needed a win to go to the playoffs, and actually pulled off the return, but missed the extra point. Oh, my and God. That- to me, that was the football gods going, no, 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 no. It, there could only be one. You can't have it. This is, okay, this is actually my favorite story. So one of my best friends from growing up went to Stanford, and I know that sounds like one of my best friends went to Stanford, but, uh, you know, still one of my best friends. And um, he attended the next year the Stanford SC game at SC. So it's 1983, Stanford at SC, the year after the play. Well, the SC marching band for their halftime show decides to do a very slow motion reenactment of the play, which is very taunting. Um, and um, I, uh, so as I understand it, you, the SC band is dressed as Cal players, Stanford players, Stanford band, and they're going through the whole thing and mocking and mocking, and they get to the point where the fake Cal players are running through the fake Stanford band and the real Stanford band, which is on the sidelines, just gets up, charges, and gang tackles the SC band member dressed up as Kevin Bowen, and (laughs) a fight starts. He he said, you know, and I I respect the Stanford band because it's one thing that it happened once and you're always going to get clowned for it, but you're not doing that to us in slow motion, you know, as a taunt. So the Stanford band charges the field and just, you know, nope, and gang tackles the guy at like the 20. And they rewrote then, history. <laughs> they rewrote, and then there's a brawl. And so, you know, I listen, you, it might happen once, but you're not doing that to us in slow motion again. Well, it's, I mean, it, it reminds me of uh, Gladiator where, <laughs> where they got – are we supposed to win the Battle of Carthage? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, and and I'm sure to else. I'm sure to Elway, who I got to know very well later. I'm sure it felt as though he had experienced the other side of that because because that was that was also a weird era where there weren't that many bowl games. It was a big deal to go to any bowl game, and Stanford was five and five, and all they needed to do was win that game, and they were going to go to the Hall of Fame Bowl which, yeah. you know, John Elway and Cal was six and four, but I uh, wasn't going anywhere. And, uh, you know, Cal won and killed John Elway's bolt. So it was, there was a lot going on. That was awesome. Well, let's, let's wrap this up just by <laughs> bringing it back to, to 49ers. I, I love talking the glory days of the pack, right? RIP to the, 
to the pack. That's it's crazy that we're talking about that now. You, you'll be in the Big Ten. We're going to be in the ACC. No, we're with, we're with you. We're with you. You're in the ACC too. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Together. Yeah. In fact, yeah, we're, that we're, was actually that was actually the coolest part. I thought that you know where Washington screwed Washington State and Oregon screwed Oregon State and UCLA decided to screw Cal. It's UC, you know, Cal and Stanford stayed aligned the whole they did, time. They did, yeah. They, you're, you're right. That shows you how much I tuned out when that happened. That yeah, was just, I know. It's, know it's, 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 a, it's a horrible shame. It's it's. I'm hoping that we can get to a point where in a few years where football is its own entity and whatever yes. happens. And you can have the non-revenue verified. sports. Yeah. But then exactly. we can get back to regional for everything else. Um, and, you know, and, and listen, football, I think it's Cal Stanford have similar institutional sensibilities where we might have moments where it gets good, but I just don't think Cal Stanford are ever going to do the things that the Ohio States and the Alabamas are willing to do institutionally. I, I think they should, arguably economically it would be worth it to go for it and just get that revenue stream but you know i don't i don't know what's going to happen football wise to to our schools but i do think you know we compete for championships in every single other sport and um you know wherever we are uh, i i would say that's bad news other than men's basketball it's it's really bad news for the acc in other sports uh you know that Cal and Stafford are coming in because yeah. showing that, up with everything else from swimming yeah, not, on down. Yeah. yeah it's, it's not, it's not going to be good. Yeah. All right. Well, who do you think, and this is, uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, what next move the 49ers will make just to send people off into the night, have a good dinner here. What do you think the 49ers make their next move? I, I still think when I look at the, the depth chart, safety is that kind of a glaring weakness. I'm yeah. talking about free agency. Obviously they've got 10 draft picks. I think they have 18 spots left on the 90 man roster to me that DB position safety in particular seems to me uh, a spot where a veteran could fortify things in, in an effective way, especially since that market has lagged. Where, where, where do you yeah. think they make their next move? I think it's there and I'm holding out hope that it will be there and that it will be one, a marquee signing. And I know on paper, you look at Simmons and go, that's the marquee name, but I, I think to them, Blackman is a marquee signing. Uh, that could be a game changer back there. So, um, you know, they're clearly playing a, a game where they don't think the market's going to get good enough for these safeties that they don't have to pounce now. But, you know, maybe there's an inflection point where if you're Blackman or Simmons or one of these guys, you just go, wow, I think I'm just going to take a one-year deal, go to the Niners and and try to win a championship and, and worry about it next year. Um, and then we could get some pretty significant news. You know, interestingly too, Lynch said that the 49ers did not promise Blackman a starting spot. Like, well, uh, that might have been the sticking point when when he visited. They, I think that they're looking at this. Talano Ufanga coming back from the ACL. They say that the recovery is going well. They like Jair Brown, second year guy. I think they really would like to set up a real competition. Right, so they can I, cover I, all their bases. I think you can not promise a starting spot, but send signals that and, yeah. if you if you're playing the way we just saw you play on film last year, that the, you, it's you, pretty likely, you know. So fine, yeah, but but I think it, I think it, they it, want to be able to say we're we're not promising a starting spot. They want to be able to tell Jair Brown and Hufanga that too, you know, truthfully, but. In my opinion, if they got Simmons or Blackman in their mind, they would. Well, oh, Simmons, of course, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I think I, I, they I, would. They would believe. I think that Blackman is the starter, and that you know, in their mind, now a lot of things could happen, and you know, one guy is coming off the injury, certainly. And as you said, uh, three safeties is a legitimate possibility w- way to go for, at times in in Staley's back end, at least uh, defense. So yeah, I, I, you know, look. Um, I think it's money. I think they would do it right now if if either of those guys would come all the way down to whatever they're offering. And I think if you're Simmons or Blackwood, you're sitting there thinking, dude, I'm too good for that for that slot. And at some point, someone's gonna pay me or so you know, but you know how it goes. People draft safeties and then they, you know, you think the market can get even worse after the draft. Yeah, yeah you never know. It's uh no, so I don't point. know. 
It'll be interesting. I think, uh, you know, I'm holding out hope that they'll get a, a game changing potential game changer at safety still. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that just seems when you look at the Tetris, that is the 53 man projection. That seems to be where that piece uh, does need to slot in. Oh, Mike, this was awesome. We talked for an hour and 20 minutes. And we fil- like we filibustered. We yeah, did. we did filibuster. I'm sure there was people. We'll go look at the comments later, see what people are asking. But I think we just had too many old Cal Stanford stories to tell, to, to wade into that there. Anyway, Mike Silver, check him out over on the Chronicle. Has done awesome work throughout uh, his entire career covering the 49ers. I mean, this we talked about. It goes back to the 80s and uh, this year, you've done a fantastic job and looking forward to seeing you at the facility, probably what, at the draft, right, at the end of this month? I will see you there for the draft. Um, I hope we will have lots of food as per draft day tradition. And uh, yeah, that's a polite way of saying that I'm old, uh, but I was there for the unveiling. Never, you could never take that away from me. You were there for the unveiling and you were there for the play too. So uh, you've you've been there for many iconic Bay area football moments. Well, I was, I do, I do believe I'll leave you with this. I do believe I'm the only person who was at the play, the music city miracle and the Minnesota miracle. uh, For example, like I, I have, when it comes to physically attending miracle finishes, I've got a pretty good uh, resume. There is probably no way that it, because two of those are NFL games. So I could see some national NFL writers being at both of the, the last two, but to also toss in Cal Stanford in 82 would be highly unlikely that some that's a parlay right there. I think I got the parlay. I, I was feeling good about it after the music city miracle, but you know, it's tough to check. But after the Minnesota miracle, I was like, you know what? Parlay parlay, put it out on Twitter. Have you put it out on Twitter? You could, you could kind of. No, so somebody might claim to have been at all three, but then they're going to have to bring forward evidence. Maybe, and, maybe you'll tweet this clip, and then I'll have to, you know, deal with the fallout. D- deal that, yeah. Uh, I think you. I think it's almost a safe bet that you are the only one. So, I got a ticket. I got a ticket stub uh, from the play, and I have uh, obviously, you know, links to stories i wrote from yeah movie. yeah you're on some credential list somewhere even if you threw away the credential i got a sports i got a story in sports illustrated by the way the lead takes place in jeff fisher's kitchen thank you that night um and i uh, i have an nfl.com awesome. <laughs> link off of the music city so there you go cool jeff fisher's kitchen in nashville i guess uh, yeah, i i right think now. it was it was either brentwood or franklin you know somewhere over there maybe a little more rural back then but yeah. uh you know, it's a city I know you have a lot of affection for, and uh, I I used to love covering those Titans teams, man. What what fun teams! They're building a new stadium out here. We're about to start. It's going to be crazy. I'm hoping but the Niners play there at some point soon. But it's I think it's it's going to they're build they build this one faster. Than they build it anywhere else. Where are they putting it? it? It's right at where the old one's going to be. It's going to be oh. do the whole parking lot thing. They're going to build it. By the river, yeah, the whole thing. And yeah. the whole thing is going to be this energy. It's going to be crazy because it already is with Broadway across the bridge. It's already a really good pregame walk to the stadium thing. Now you're going to have a whole, almost like a mission rock, except, except I think way livelier, right? With like the nightlife scene by, wow. by the stadium. Wow. So can't yeah. even, I can't fathom Nashville being even more fun, but <laughs> it, it sounds like it's getting there. Yeah, it would be nuts. All right, Mike, thanks again. All right, Dave, thank you. All right, that's Mike Silver. We will talk to you guys next time.